So if you recall, we were talking about completeness, right? And the definition of completeness was this um, technical definition that if you have um, a statistic, it's going to be complete if whenever I form a function of it, and it turns out that this function is uh, first order ancillary, which means that its mean does not have anything to do with theta. So it loses information about theta in expectation. Um, then that function has to be constant. Um, or let's say if it was zero, then it has to be zero. Um, and then we try to prove that in the context of this uniform um, example, um, So theta is the um, endpoint of the support. And so we try to show that um, the maximum is um, sufficient. So the way we did this was, was to write down um, a gen generic sort of equation um, like this. So we assume that f when applied to t is um, first or ancillary. And if this holds for all theta, it, it would look like something like that. And um, this p tilde here is the density of p of x. And then we try to argue that if this holds for all theta, then f has to be uh, um, zero, right? So that was the approach. And then there's some calculation on the density. And then you use the fundamental theorem of calculus uh, because this range would depend on theta here. So when you... Um, have this integral equation, you, you differentiate and you conclude that if t is zero and towards the end, um, this interesting idea came up that we could probably view this as an inner product, uh, right? Michael mentioned it, and I guess uh, the, um, so if you view it as, a inner, as an inner product, um, then this seems to say, say that, um, the inner product of f with this density is zero. The space in which we have to work is, is sort of called the L2. And I'm going to get uh, to that in a moment or like today. Um, but if, if a function is orthogonal to all these densities, if there are enough of them, then it has to be zero. So this is sort of the functional analytic viewpoint. And I guess, as Josh mentioned, so if the span is dense in L2, so this is fine. Um, uh, and you can try to develop this. I just wanted to point out that um, this is an interesting viewpoint. I haven't seen it done. Um, I've seen like some people like do it this way. Um, but if you want to like get into this like functional analytic viewpoint, I just wanted to point out to this paper and so the issues that, um, so if you're interested, this pair are due to Lucien Lacan. So he's the guy who, who how many people know, like Lucien Lacan? No one, okay. So if you're interested in theoretical statistics, and so he passed away. So this paper, I, I encourage you to read about it. If you're interested in functional analysis and statistics, because he's the guy who sort of um, um, like he was like mathematician slash a statistician. So he brought very deep ideas from other branches of mathematics. And so he introduced functional analysis into the study of the statistics. And so he passed away in 2020. And um, so Odd Landerwerk, so he's um, the guy who wrote this book, Asymptotic Statistics. It's on, on, web page, like, uh, on the web page of the course. It's, it's a standard textbook for asymptotic statistics. So he's in this um, article, uh, like outlines his statistical, like statistical uh, work of Lucien Lacan. It's a very readable paper. And uh, so, his work is not easy to read. So I see it's like point out. So, uh, and they're not always easy to consume in their original book. Lacan's like 1986 book can be viewed as his own summary of his theory up to date. And he like, and that book has a reputation of being hard to read. Okay. So if you open up that book, he sets up statistics as like 
an abstract problem using functional analysis tools. So I just want to point out some ideas from here. Uh, so you're not going to see, unfortunately. Uh, so by the end of this course, you might be able to like have appreciate if you read this. But these ideas uh, are not, um, so you're not going to have time to go over them. Uh, but you, you, if you read it, you, you'd see some of the like ideas that we touch upon. Um, what I wanted to go over is basically just mention this if you are interested. Uh, it's very hard to find. So you can see there. Yeah. So, um, so this part about efficiency, if you read a little bit about this, so he's trying to compare two statistical experiments and um you would see some something like a risk so that's um, so this this part you should be able to sort of read so this is our risk that's like the risk and this is the estimator uh, or the decision rule um here it's randomized we're going to talk about that so a randomized decision rule basically is a markov kernel but that that's not relevant but this part is very readable so this section seven is very readable to you guys and he is talking about like this black hole sham and sign here that sort of connects risk with sufficiency. So um, maybe we'll, we'll talk about this if you, if you read it. Um, it's a very interesting idea. But um, what I want to say is uh, once you read this, um, here you get to this this part, which is discussing. Um, like that's that's how like in one of his papers, 1964 papers, he sets up a statistical experiment. So a statistical experiment is this set of like triplet. So this looks familiar to you guys, like p theta, and then there's the sample space, uh, and then there's this uh, theta, which is uh, let's say parameter space, and there's this e. So this e is um, basically for for us would be like l. Um, Forgot what we did. Like yeah, so like let's say a. Um, so the functions that map, basically, um, yeah, it's very difficult. Oh, last name. So so that that e would be like the the sort of risk, uh, not the risk, but the loss functions basically. But I just want to point out that this is his view. So. Um, set E bounded numerical functions on a set X, that map which to each theta associates a numerical function P theta defined on E. So E is like the set of your losses, basically loss of decision rules, and this P theta is going to assign a numerical value. That's the risk. So you apply like the expectation, basically, you get the risk. And then um, the system assumed to be like, E is like a vector lattice. Uh, that's the functional again. Uh, so the, the functions, um, uh, that's fine. And then the, the third is like this. This is a, like a positive normalizing your functional link. So um, the, um, this is like the functional analysis viewpoint. What, what I wanted to say is sort of that, um, yeah, it's, it's a little bit hard to describe, but I just wanted to get to this point that once you view things like this, um, I mean, one particular functional is like that. So his work is more general than probability. So, but but you can think of probabilities as as like functionals in the space of functions. So if I give you if you give me a function, so this is very similar to what we had, right? So, um, so integral f t p tilde theta of t dt. So think of this if you want, like d p tilde. This is like the measure theory version. This is like the distribution. Distribution acts on functions and it produces a number. Okay, so what we had, like for example, that this is zero, and then we wanted to conclude that f is zero. So this view, if you view it this way, um, these distributions are functional in this space of functions, and this is going to be sort of a duality. It's not an inner product in general, but you can write it like f. You can write it here. F P theta. So if you want to do it generally, this would be a space of functions. These are dual to this. These are not functions, but probabilities. So you can, like a function interacts with probability, 
So you can think of it as an inner product, but it's not in general in L2 because um, um, so, so the densities are not generally in L2, but, but this works because F is integrable. And so this is defined. So this, this would be like, a, um, this would live in a Bonnock space. And this would live in a like the dual of it. So if you view it this way, everything seems to work. And then I let you try to figure it out. Okay, but that's where these things belong. Okay, so um, if you're interested, read through this and let me know if you can sort of figure out the details. But the approach of yeah, like Michael suggested, works in general, but it might be best to view it in terms of these. Um, so Bonnock spaces don't have inner products, they have norms, um, but, but it's, it's best to view it like this. So a function and then a functional, and then the functional axon is produced as a number. So this is sort of the, the structure for functional matrix. So, and uh, if, you, if you view things in this way, so interesting things might happen, but that's just the point. So read seven, seven is very readable. And if you're really interested, like look at eight, okay? You're welcome to, to look at the rest. Um, this is a very rich paper. His, his contributions, like we see on the comment, very deep, very, very deep. So if you read, you would get some appreciation of, he's trying to explain what he did, which is not easy to understand in the first place. So is that sort of good enough? That, that was just the detour, um, but it was a very welcome detour. So um, I'm gonna go back to our material, okay? Sounds good. So there is some avenue to apply functional analysis tools um, that are not, um, you're not, you're, you're gonna do a little bit of that. Okay, so you're gonna do a little bit of that, um, but, but any questions or sort of, just wanted to like advertise that paper. If you're interested in functional analysis slash statistics, read that and then there are a lot of references to other places. Um, good. Now we're back like to our own detour, like planned detour. That was like unplanned detour. Uh, this is the planned detour. So I'm gonna take a detour, discuss con uh, conditional expectation. Um, why are this geometric perspective? Because it's very useful for us. Um, there is a bit of like a functional analysis here, but it's like in the background. So you don't necessarily need to worry about Bonnach spaces because everything's like sort of is in an inner product space. And so I'm going to focus on, so what I want to do now is basically the, let me show you what I want to do. I want to prove this result that uh, if you have a complete sufficient statistic, it would be minimal sufficient. So we discussed the minimal sufficiency and, and then we discussed completeness. Completeness is a um, um, strong notion. And, and this result is saying that if, if something is complete and also sufficient, it has to be minimal sufficient. So it's the completeness is stronger than minimal sufficiency. But in order to understand this proof, the, the easiest way to understand it, and it's also very useful later, is to um, understand this idea of um, conditional expectation. So let me ask you guys, see how many people know what conditional expectation is. Just let's not look at this. Um, so what is conditional expectation? Yeah. Okay, so that's very advanced, and it's like where I want to talk about. But I, I was hoping for like a like an intuitive. I, I want an intuitive so that I can tell you the other perspective. What is the intuitive? Yes. So, so like the sigma algebra is, is like the like formalizing like information you have or like yes experiments you're able to run. So like smaller ones or like you have less information or are able to run less fewer kinds of experiments. So it's like the conditional expectation is supposed to be like the best guess of this more complicated thing relative to the small. Right. This is still like yeah. the abstract. So you have to come down, like maybe someone else, like forget about measure theory. This is the first 
time you learned about a conditional expectation, what was it? Because that's like the, the intuition. So, so you have to like two variables, right? Right. It's saying basically, I'm gonna like take the average of y over the values of x, sort of. That's the conditional expectation that usually you know, right? So you have two random variables. I give you the value of one. Now, given this value, um, there is sort of, or let's say the, the distribution sort of changes. So usual like so expectation is like an average. So integral y, let's say py of y dy. So this is like um, a weighted average of values of y uh, relative to, or the weights produced by this, by this um, density, right? The probability. So values multiplied by the probabilities of observing those values and then the average. So this is defined similarly, like in, in like elementary probability, this would be y, but the conditional density of y given x, right? y given x e um, y. So this is saying that once I condition on x, the, the joint distribution or the, the, the distribution of y changes. So now I have a conditional distribution. Some, some values of y are more likely than the other once I observe x. Maybe a, a priori, I have less information, but once I condition, especially if y is a function of x, let's say, you know a lot more. So this, this probability distribution is going to change. And now I'm going to take the average with respect to that. Okay, so there is a conditional density or distribution, and this is just the expectation of that. Okay, that's that's like the elementary way, right? So you're averaging over the values of y, but with these weights that are not changed due to. Okay, um, this viewpoint that uh, I just want to mention is like the functional analytic viewpoint, and avoids the densities and the stuff, uh, but it captures the idea sort of nicely. Um, and as Josh, Josh was pointing out, it, it's really, it relates to like uh, what is your best guess given the information in X. So that, that's what I want to sort of point out, which is, uh, which is easy. I, I mean, this is also intuitive. I would, I would argue that this is also intuitive. But if you view things this way, some of the more, um, some of the properties that otherwise using the elementary um, definition are harder to show would be immediately um, evident. So the view is that um, we can look at the random variables, let's say, Whose, whose second moment is finite as uh, living in, in this uh, so-called L2 space. So think of random variables. Remember, um, they are functions from uh, your sample space, we call this X, to let's say R. So these are really functions. So the things that we say, for example, expectation is, 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 is finite. It means um, that, that like this function, there's like a... Um, um, there's a probability distribution on this space, right? So um, like x uh, omega squared dp omega, if you want. So there is there is like an L, like integral of this against the probability distribution is finite. But if you if you don't want to worry about this, this is fine. I just want to say that this is the same as the functional analytic viewpoint. So if you think of random variables as functions, you're view, you're viewing them as single objects in the space. So um, but I'm just going to write this simply like the expectation, but think of the entire variable as an object. Okay, so an object in this space, um, and this space has an inner product. So you can, you can write the inner product as um, the expectation of x times y. Uh, again, if you want, this, this is like that integral. So x omega y omega dp omega, if you want. So it's like very much uh, similar to this the thing that we had here, but there is a weight here. So there's it's like a weighted related integral, right? But but in any case, even if you forget about this, this is a all the time inner product. What, what, what do we mean by inner product? Uh, it uh, has the properties, like it's linear. So if I have, for example, x plus x prime and y, this would be like inner product of x and y plus inner product of x prime and y, and the other properties. Right? So binding your form has the other necessary properties. And the fact that this is all the time follows from this um, L2 properties because both of them are in L2, then there's the Cauchy Schwarz that tell you that this, this is integral. So the expectation of the absolute value of this is bounded by um, this is sort of the Cauchy Schwarz bounded by this. Uh, say this squared is bounded by this times the expectation of y squared. Uh, Cauchy Schwarz. 
And so this is well defined. There's an inner product. Whenever you have an inner product, you can define norms, right? The norm would be the square root of the inner product of that object in itself. And I'll think of these as objects right? in, in, in the vector space. And the, the space is clearly a vector space. I can add two variables. Uh, and you can argue that if you have x and y here, if you add them, the, the all two norm still is fine. So it's in the space. If I scale them, they're in the space. So this is like a really a vector space. Um, addition of objects is closed under the ad addition of elements and also a scalar multiplication. There is a inner product, so it's, it's really an inner product of space. And once I have an inner product, I have a norm. Um, and the norm is basically the square root of the second moment. Okay. So the second, like, um, square root of the second moment is the norm. Whenever you have the norm, you have a distance. So the distance would be the norm of the difference of x and y. <clears throat> Plug this into here, and it gives you this. And so this is the called the L2 distance. Okay, so I can measure some distance between variables. And whenever you have like measures of distance, you can like, measure closeness. So I can say this random variable is close to the other one if, if it's small. And because this is a norm, if this is zero, it means that they're identical. Like almost sure. Okay. So um, there's a square distance. And so that it has other properties, like um, again, people who are interested in like the analysis part, this is really a complete space. So it's 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 a so-called Hilbert space because it has an inner product which is the way it's complete. So it's really Hilbert space. But for, for us, that part is like minor. Um, I just want to emphasize the geometric part. So you have you can you can impose or um, let's say define an inner product on the space of random variables that have finite second moments such that um, that inner product leads to a norm, leads to a distance. Once you have a distance, you can talk about ortho like sorry, well, once you have this distance, you can talk about projections as we'll see. You can also talk about orthogonality. You can inner products give you like geometric ideas of being orthogonal and also angle. So x and y would be orthogonal if this is zero. So we define x to be orthogonal to y if the inner product is zero, which means that the expectation of x, y is zero. Okay. All of this would be like familiar if you just um, um, treat these as usual vectors in RD. Okay. If you, if you treat them as, uh, let's say, if, if oh, everything that I, I'm going to tell you, if it's complicated, you can think of uh, x like equivalent to like some vector, x1, x2 in R2 y is like y1 y2 and then the inner product is gonna be summation xi yi i from one to two the norm is gonna be as you plug it in it would be like root xx which is gonna be root summation xi squared so the beauty of like doing this abstract viewpoint is that this setting is very similar to the setting that we're going to talk about the only difference is this is a finite dimensional case this is infinite dimensional but everything else, like in your intuition here, for example, from the distance of from the norm, you get the distance, you can write it down. Um, everything works out almost exactly the same, almost. So to, throughout this, think of x as uh, random variables or as an abstract vector, we can just replace it with usual Euclidean vectors. So if, if you replace everything with Euclidean vectors, forget about the finite finite the second moment. Then everything sort of should be clear, right? This is the definition of orthogonality. This is the distance, usual Euclidean distance. This is the norm, squared distance, and so on. Okay, good. Okay, so now what I want to do is I want to say I have y. Um, I want uh, I want to find the closest uh, random variable. Uh, to y that I can, I can represent as a function of x. So, so this part is actually a little bit out of the um, classical uh, um, the, 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 there's an equivalent version of this for the Euclidean um, usual Euclidean space but um, back to the like the random variables uh, what I want to do is, is I want to find a function of x that's closest to y in this L2 sense okay so uh, why I would like to do that, because let's say in practice, I observe x, and I want to predict y, and I want a function of x, I can form functions of x, I don't see y. I want, I want functions of x, let's say g of x, um, yeah. such that 
um, this distance of g of x to y is going to be uh, small. Right. I want to choose this g of x such that this is very small, which, which means that um, g of x is a good approximation of y in this, this um, L2 norm. And um, what I'm going to do is, as I'm going to define the class of uh, objects in that space, so all, all the random variables that can be written as g of x, a function of x, um, such that the expectation of this squared is finite. Um, this, this would be a subspace of that L2 space, okay? Because if you form again, g measurable, let's say, g of x is another random variable, because we're assuming the second moment is finite. It's a random variable of finite moment. So this space is um, a subspace of L2, and you can also verify that it's a linear subspace. So if I add two functions um, of x, I get another function of x. It's very clear. If I like multiply this by two, it's another function of x. So this space is closed under addition. So g1x plus g2 of x. So if g1x is in L and G2 of X is in L, um, then G1 plus G2 would be in L. This is clearly another function. Uh, and also you can verify that if you said that um, if this has finite second moment, this has finite second moment, the addition has finite second moment. So this is a linear space. And um, you can also try to argue that it's closed. Uh, the closeness is. Um, like the technical part that we need for the uh, infinite dimensional case. But that, that I'm going to skip. So what we, we care about is um, if I want a function that's closest to y, a function of x that's closest to y, basically I'm solving this problem. So I'm going to look in this class of random variables, the generic z in this L, right, uh, that's closest to y. So that the problem that I'm trying to solve is trying to minimize the distance of y to z, where z is in this L. So the picture is uh, this script L is, is a subspace. So you can think of it as like a plane in this infinite dimensional space, uh, itself potentially infinite dimensional, but it's like a plane. And y is another vector here. And I'm going to pick like a generic z here and then measure the distance. Um, Right, this z will have a distance geometrically would look like this, y minus z. Okay, and then I'm going to vary this um, in this subspace until I hit a place. Let's do another bad case. So this, for example, this is going to be distance is going to be large until I, 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 this is another z, let's say z prime, until I find a case where uh, the distance is minimum. Okay, uh, I'm going to call this one y hat. Okay, argument here means the argument that minimizes this. So the z that minimizes this, I'm going to call it y hat. By definition, it's in the subspace. So this y hat is going to be a function of x. Right, there is a function such that the y hat is a function of x. And also, it has the property that among all functions of x, this is the one that minimizes distance to y. So it's the best approximation of y in this norm. Yes. The image of G is also in curvy L. Or? The image of G, what do you mean by image? So G of X is um, another random variable. I'm not looking at the, I'm looking at, at it as a random variable. So if you really want, this is really uh, composition of G and X, right? X is a random variable from like, which is a function, if you recall. And G of this like is a composition of G with that function. So it's like G O F, but it's a new random value. So it's easier to not view things as functions of random value. So when I have X, let's say, um, could be like X squared, if it still like has, like, let's say X has all the moments of like, infinitely many moments, X squared would be in here. Like X squared plus X would be in here. All the polynomials of X would be in here. And just like that in the X to the respects and stuff. Yes, ob yeah, obviously, yes. Yes, that's another one. It could turn out that like this Y hat is actually X. That, that would be interesting, right? Um, but but that's that's what I'm trying to do. In general, it's not gonna be 
So I'm going to find a function here. Um, so, so a member of this class, which will have to be a function um, uh, such as it has this property. So there is going to be a, they could, there exists like a um, g hat such that they can write this y hat as g hat x because it's in there in that L. Uh, and then just can say that the minimum over all G, if I replace this Z with G of X, minimum over all functions of G um, is this. So this G hat of X is, is the one that minimizes uh, this uh, among all uh, functions of X. And this is sort of um, another way of saying is that um, this G hat X has uh, the smallest um, MSE mean a squared error for predicting Y, let's say. Um, predicting. So if you think of um, this as measuring sort of the loss or measuring error, like expected error, um, this is the MSE mean the squared error. And so you're saying uh, the function of X that minimizes this MSE um, is um, G hat. In other words, this is our best prediction in the MSE sense of Y among functions of X. Um, and this I'm gonna call the conditional expectation of Y given X. Okay, that's like the abstract viewpoint. So this object, which is a function of X, um, which has this uh, like optimality property, it's like basically, if, if you think about this as geometrically, it's just a projection of Y onto this space. Okay, the, the guy that has the smallest um, distance is, is the projection. So if you know projection, that's the definition of projection. So the conditional expectation is basically the projection of Y onto the space of all functions of X. So among all functions of X, this is the best um, in class. Best means closest to Y in this distance. And this distance has the meaning of MSE. So the best mean a square prediction, let's say of Y given X, that's the conditional expectation by definition, the way I define. Okay, this has, doesn't have any like, uh, um, um, like density is involved or such, right? But um, it, it, it provides, like it turns out that when you have densities, this is similar, like exactly can, can be calculated using uh, the formula they mentioned. So if you have these densities are well-defined, there's a conditional density of Y given X, that formula would be exactly this. But this we can work out in general for any, basically L2 value. So that's how you can get uh, away from like having densities and stuff. Um, and, and if you like fill in some of the details, this is going to work out. So you can think of conditional expectation as a projection operator. So projects random variables onto the space of functions of X. Okay, so if you know projection operators, they have very nice properties. This has all those properties. And then you can extend it to L1. L1 is like the space of all random variables that have like integrable, not a square integrable. So this is stronger than just saying, for example, um, but that that's like a little step to extend this projection operator to L1. For us, we're gonna stop here. Um, good. Yes. So this is a good point. So that's how I defined it. It turns out because this, this is this is how you can define a projection, uh, but because this norm is coming from a near product, it turns out that this has to have the orthogonal property. So it's going to be equivalent to. Um, so if this is the case, um, because this is coming from an inner product, and it's really easy to prove here. Uh, we should have the error, so which is going to be y minus y hat. That's the error here. Um, this is going to be, um, let's say, y, this, this vector. Um, intuitively, you can see if things are in an inner product of space, this is going to be y minus y hat. This has to be orthogonal to L. So this has to be orthogonal to L, and this is the characterizing property of projection. So Y hat is going to be the projection, i.e., 
uh, will have the smallest distance if the error, the residual, whatever you want to call it, y minus y hat is orthogonal to L, which means that it's orthogonal to every element of L. So it means this is this is saying that y minus y hat is orthogonal to z for every z in L. Um, another way of saying it is um, and the same thing I can say is equivalent to saying that y minus y hat is going to be orthogonal to g of x for all functions g such that um, g of x is measurable and square integral. Right, so that's that's the defining property. This is equivalent to, um, and the way that you can do is you can just square this, expand it, and try to argue. Um, yes. Um, just to what's the essential uniqueness? The essential uniqueness. Um, that's like the almost sure business, but but because you're in 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 a, in a product space, the projection would be unique. Yes, you can also show. Uh, and and sorry because because you're projecting onto a linear subspace. If you're projecting onto a weird set, you could have multiple projections. But projecting onto a linear subspace, closed linear subspace here, we are we are in an inner product space. This is going to be unique. Um, so what this means is, uh, if I translate it, if you remember what this inner product mean, means, that y minus y hat and g of x, the inner product is zero for all g. And this inner product, if you recall, is just y minus y hat times g of x expectation. So this is saying that uh, the, expect the, the conditional, the, this y hat has that property. Okay? And because I, I called y hat the conditional expectation, this is saying that, um, or let's say if I can write it as um, g hat x if you want. Uh, there are multiple ways of writing it, y minus g hat x times g of x is equal to zero, or we call this conditional expectation, right? Uh, so I define this to be the conditional expectation of y given x. You can see it's just another function of x. Uh, so I get this result that y minus the conditional expectation of y given x is going to be orthogonal to every, uh, this holds for any g. So if you, if you look up, for example, measure theory book, they usually like have this, the G being the indicator of some set. So that's the orthogonality principle. So if I find a function G hat that satisfies this, um, that has to be the orthogonal projection. Yeah, the only, only the orthogonal projection satisfies this is it's orthogonal to every function or every, every element of that set. Okay, um, again, if you follow this argument, it's very like simple starting from this geometric argument that this has to be true for every um, element in L and every element in L looks like this. And if you just replace what um, orthogonality means here, you get something like that, okay? So basically Y minus X expectation is gonna be orthogonal to every function of X. And the residual after you project is orthogonal to all functions of X. Uh, from this, you get very nice properties. Okay, a lot of properties of conditional expectation follow from this. And so, is this clear to people? Okay. So, for example, um, uh, like a trivial function is g of x being one, identity identity one. If I plug it in here, so it has to be orthogonal to the all ones function. So, what do I get if I plug it there? Sorry, I try, yeah, yeah. Okay, so you get this, y minus expectation of y given x is uh, zero, because this is one, so this is, I can expand, you get expectation of y minus expectation, of put it to the other side. This is um, like law of, uh, is it iterated expectation? Yeah, so iterated, iterated expectation, um, or you could call it like, um, what else do people call this? Power property of conditional expectation. Conditional expectation. Some people call it a smoothing property. I'm gonna often call it a smoothing property because like, taking expectation is like smoothing, I smooth it out to get back the original expectation. Okay. Um, 
Can you zoom in? Zoom in? Uh, right, okay. More than this, okay. Is this good? Yeah, that's Yeah, so, so this you have seen probably. So if I take the conditional expectation and then take another expectation, this would give me the expectation of y. But if you understand this geometric property, it's just saying that the residuals are orthogonal to all ones. It's just one aspect of conditional expectation. It's orthogonal to many other things, including one. Um, it's like, deeply think about it. This is not something very um, strange or unique. Okay. Um, and the other thing that this viewpoint just emphasizes or drills down is that conditional expectation is really a random variable. Okay, so expectation of y given x is another random variable. It's a function of x. First, it's a function of x the way you define it, and also it's a random variable. It has expectations, has variances, and so on. Okay, so it's a new variable. This is your best prediction of y given x. Okay, the best I can do. And this viewpoint of best prediction in MSE of one variable given the other is very useful for us for us because we can like construct decision rules and decision rules you can condition and every time that you condition what is the best that they can do something like this is the best that you can do yes is it still the same idea of like adding the information of y or x like yeah it has the idea that um so so this carries all the information in x so if you think about um so if you have seen measure theory, what people work with is usually sigma fields of random variables, right? Just look up a measure. So this is equivalent. This is like functional view of sigma fields. So this, this would be equivalent to having the sigma field. So all the functions that I can form of X basically carry the information in X. So this class is like an abstract way of saying how much information X has. So you can restrict this to the class of like indicator function. Uh, that would be equivalent to the sigma field, but there is like a duality between uh, sets and functions. So it's sort of equivalent. So I'm going to look at this instead of looking at the sigma field generated by X for people that are interested in measure theory. This has the same information. Think of, think of information around the variable as the set of all possible functions I can make of it. Okay, that, um, you can go into this, but that's that saying, given this information, what is the best I can do? You can find some other function because all these I can compute from X, okay? So this is all the things that I can compute from X. You can think of it as information that's in X, right? That X gives you this information. Like once I have X, I know completely this class. And given this information, what is the best I can do? I don't see Y. So there's a component of Y that's not in this. So this part is the part whose information I don't see. This is the information that I see from X or can compute from X. So saying, given the information computable from X, what is the best I can do? And that's the best you can do, okay? Good. This view is very useful. So whatever questions you have, let me know. I'm gonna assign some, I probably already assigned more problems. Once you have this, there are a lot of interesting properties of conditional expectation that follows, for example, this, this property, you don't need to do any integrals. It just follows from the orthogonality. Uh, a lot of other things would follow. For example, if I project something twice, it's not going to change. So if I, um, for example, have like this, y given x, and then take the conditional expectation of this given x, what would happen? Sorry? Like, uh, yes, why? So, you know, you expect the uh, last the it's, it's still not power Right, but like like projection viewpoint, how does how can you like argue this using projections? Why this is true? Sorry? Yeah, so intuitively, once you project Y into this, if I now project this back into L, it's going to be itself. It's already in there. It's the closest. Right, so this is my Y hat. It's already in that L. So you're saying you project it once. Now you're in L. Um, now I want to project it in this operations projection. It's going to give you back Y hat. Right, so projection of Y hat is going to be itself. 
and you can do this by with subspaces. So if you have a subspace, so if you have like x has two components and they just form functions of one part, right? That's still functions of the entire x. So that would be a subspace here. Then I can project onto the subspace and what is the relation projecting into the bigger sub of the space? So this projection viewpoint would, would solve a lot of uh, otherwise uh, hard to prove things. So I'm sure you see in the work. So this extension of this you will see in the work from. Okay. So conditional expectations are projections, or like um, the conditional expectation is a projection operator, and the results are projections, and so on. Good questions. Okay, now equipped with this, we're gonna like like attack that problem. Okay, so how do we prove this? Um, the complete sufficient statistic is minimal sufficient. So um, I already know that the statistic is sufficient. So let's say T is um, complete. Let me maybe not show it, see if I can. It's always fun to try to prove something yourself. And I don't, this is like a tricky proof. Let's see if we can reproduce it. So T is um, complete sufficient. I wanna show that T is minimal sufficient. Okay. Um, a hint is here. So let T be complete sufficient. Let U be, so proof. Let U be minimal sufficient. So we know that these exist under general conditions. This could, this could be like a likelihood function, something like that. So like a generic minimal sufficient statistic. What I need to do to show that T is minimal sufficient is to show that T is a function of U, right? It's enough to show that T is a function of U, then because U is a function of every other sufficient statistic, it would, would be um, a function of um, the, um, T would be a function of any other sufficient statistic, right? So we're gonna try to show that T is a function of U, right? So that's the goal. Um, how can I show, show that T is a function of U, given the information that we uh, have, I can try to find the best approximation of T in terms of U, and then show that that is T itself. Okay, so what is the best approximation of T given U? That would be the conditional expectation of T given U. All right, I wanna show that T is a function of U. In general, um, it may not be, but even if it's not, then I'm gonna project it onto U. That's gonna be a function of, um, let's call this um, edge of u. And then this is definitely a function of u. And if it turns out that this is equal to t, then I'm done because I've shown that t is a function of u. So is it clear that it's enough to show that t is a function of u? Right? If you remember, once you have a minimal sufficient statistic. If you have another sufficient statistic, which you can write as a function of the minimal sufficient statistic would be enough. Okay, just, just go back to the definition. So now I'm gonna do this. The problem is this is gonna depend on theta because I don't know the law of, so these are all functions of X. So implicitly, this is a function of X. Uh, this is gonna also be a function of X, right? And X whose distribution, I know that it's like from P theta. So this is in general, when I take the conditional expectation, it would depend on theta because things are still dependent on, although we had this prediction view, but things are done on their complete distribution, which, which in our case depends on theta. So this is gonna depend on theta. Uh, so this I have to really write as T, oh, sorry, as theta. But if I write it as theta, then I would have a problem because this clearly can't be equal to that for all theta because this is a statistic only depends on theta. This, depends on the data and the parameter itself. So I have an issue here. Yeah, because of this dependence on theta, um, I'm not, I'm, 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 I'm in a, like a difficult position. Is there a way I can say that this really doesn't depend on theta? So this is a proper statistic. Yes. I use the completeness. The, uh, the other property, you should use the other feature. Completeness is not good enough here. Because 
it, it uses the sufficiency. So how should we use sufficiency to argue? I know that U is minimal sufficient, in particular is sufficient, right? We're gonna use completeness in a bit. So sufficiency is enough to argue that this actually doesn't depend on tape. How do you argue that? Yes, what is it? Yeah, so if we want to be precise, conditional the distribution of X, uh, distribution of X, distribution of X given U does not depend, depend on. Um, on theta, okay. So this conditioning is still like, all the things that we talked about, um, it like matches the conditioning that we mentioned before. So all, like all of it is consistent. I'm not defining a new conditional expectation. It's just a different view of things we can show that they prove that. So um, when I condition on, on this statistic view, the distribution of X given U is not, um, does not depend on theta and because t of x is a function of x the distribution of t of x given u is not going to depend on theta as well okay from this we get that distribution of t of x uh, given say distribution of t of x given everything here given u does not depend on theta okay because t of x is a function of x, the distribution of it given u just depends on the distribution of x given u, and that doesn't depend. So this, this expectation, which is the expectation of that distribution, um, doesn't depend on uh, data. So that gives me um, uh, the permission to call this the statistics of each of you without writing the data. Right, because it doesn't depend on theta, it's just some function of, you know, I know that it's a function of u, that, and that function doesn't depend on theta. Okay, that's the distribution of conditional distribution of x u. So this is really a statistic. So sufficiency of u guarantees um, uh, that this is statistic. Okay. Um, right. That's where we use sufficiency. Yes. So we haven't used the sufficiency of T yet. Yes. We use the sufficiency of U. The sufficiency of T is going to be used um, implicitly because once I show that this is a function of a minimal sufficient statistic is going to be a function of any sufficient statistic. I also know that it's sufficient, so the can the both conditions are satisfied. Okay, so that's already like we are not going to use it anywhere else. Like, it has to be sufficient for it to be minimal sufficient. That's that's where we. But we're using minimal sufficiency of u, in particular the sufficiency of u. Okay, that's that, right? Um, the next step is to show that actually h of u now is equal to t. It's a candidate to be equal to t because it's a valid statistic. So what I can do is that I can form t minus h of u and try to show that this is zero. Okay. Um, now try to show that would be good enough because then we show that t is a function of u. Okay. So how do we show this? I'm going to take the expectation first. This is where I'm going to use the completeness. The expectation is zero. That's the claim. So now why the expectation is zero? Uh, that's not enough. That doesn't depend on theta. Yeah, zero clearly doesn't depend on theta, but why is it zero? Power probability. So if we look at this, this is you, if we define the expectation of T given u, and then saying the expectation of t is equal to the expectation 
expectation expectation of community. That's exactly the property that we have here. Uh, this power property we didn't discuss. Here is like uh, T, here is T given U. But if you rearrange, you get that this is zero by tower property. And this holds for all theta because all the arguments work for all theta. So now what? I want to conclude that this T minus H of U is zero for almost every P. Uh, that's our family, right? How can I conclude from this that this is zero? Completeness. So how, how are we arguing that? So it has to be, yes. That's a good way of doing it. But a more compelling argument, maybe? It has to be used somewhere. So remember, these are functions of x, right? Um, and um, they're not actually necessarily. Can I claim that this is a function of t? They're function of z, but can I say that this is some h of t? If I can do that, let's say f of t, then then this is saying expectation of some function of t is zero, then f of t has to be zero, which is, um, this would be equivalent to uh, t minus h of u is zero. So why can I claim that? There's another property that we didn't use. So one property of u we have used, which is sufficiency. We haven't used minimal sufficiency of u. Can I claim that this is a function of t? So actually, I, I made a mistake. Here, we also are going to use the fact that t is sufficient. This is going to come into play here as well. So if I can claim that this is a function of t, because the expectation of f of t is zero for all things, then this follows and this is what I want. Okay. So how do we argue that? This part clearly is a function of t. And I claim that this is a function of t, then the whole thing would be a function of t. Yes. Yes, because right at the start, we said that u was a function of t. So a function of a function of t is a function. Of t. Where did we say that u was a function of t? Uh, we said that it's minimal sufficient. We didn't say it's a function of t. Because t is a sufficient statistic. So okay. u is a minimal sufficient statistic. So it can be written as a function. Of Great. T. That's the argument. So u is minimal sufficient. t is sufficient. Right. Minimal sufficient statistic has to be able to like be written as a function of any sufficient statistic. So there exists because of this. There exists. Uh, I don't know what I call this. Maybe G. Yeah. So there exists G, such that um, U can be written as G of T. Right. Since U is minimal sufficient, and T is sufficient. Right. By definition of minimal sufficiency, if you have an understood sufficient statistic, this u has to be able to be written as a function of t. Right. Because I can do that. Now I have like h of g of t here. So this would be really h of g of t. And so t minus h of g of t is another function of t. And so this turns out to be zero. So we have used all the information that t had. So t has to be a function of u. Uh, and we know that t is sufficient, so t has to be minimal sufficient as well. It's like there's a bijection, you already like use this. You can make it as a function of t, t also can be written as a function of u, and we know that t is sufficient, so it has to be minimal sufficient. So it's a very nice proof, simple, and the basic idea is the projection idea. So I don't know if t is a function of u, but the best I can do is project onto u, and then hope that I can like argue that this the projection is. Um, actually equal to t itself, right? So this is basically saying t is in that class of all functions of u. If you imagine this um, this class L, think of it as the, the as a x being u here, 
what you're saying is that that t has to be in this class. The way we do it is I'm going to project onto this, and if it's in this class, it's going to be equal to itself already. So that's what we did. And in, in projecting, the fact that when I project, I get back another statistic is using sufficiency of t. But this in general will be dependent on data. And this comes up a lot later. Yes. So what's the like geometric interpretation of t? Um, that's what we discussed. So that's Michael's sort of idea. We talked about like, remember this. Oh, yeah. Right. So this is sort of saying that um, it's like a conditional statement. If you're orthogonal to all these densities, then you have to be zero. It's like the space is pretty big. Essentially, like covers the entire space. So if you're orthogonal to a subspace, you need not be um, zero. But if you have a vector that's orthogonal to everything in the space, then it has to be zero. And like in general, like infinite dimensional spaces, you don't have to be orthogonal to everything, but sort of a dense subset. Uh, but then orthogonality is like a little bit iffy here, as I mentioned. You don't have an inner product in general, but there's a Bonnock space, there's a dual, and then you can worry about that. So it's like a technical thing. There's not much, geo like geometrically it means something like that, which I'm glad that it was brought up um, because I didn't have a geometric uh, like argument or like geometric viewpoint for completeness, which we now sort of have. Uh, okay, so we proved this. Any questions? So this idea that when you condition, like form conditional expectation respect to a sufficient statistic, it provides you with another statistic. This is useful, right? Whenever you wanna like construct an estimator based on an already known estimator, you can try to project or like a conditional expectation, if that thing is sufficient, you're guaranteed to be having another estimate. Questions? So completeness is a complete plus sufficient is stronger than minimal sufficiency. There's another result, which is along the same line. Um, it's proved along the same line, T being a complete sufficient statistic, like the previous result, and V being ancillary, then you can show that T and V has to be independent under all the probability distributions of the model. So this is a very strong result. And you can see completeness plus sufficiency is pretty strong. So if you have two statistics, one complete sufficient, the other ancillary, then T and V have to be independent under P theta for all theta. The way to prove it is similar. So um, one way to prove um, independence is to show, for example, uh, that the, the probability of V belonging to any set given T is the same as the like unconditional probability. That's one way of proving things, right? So for every event, basically this holds. If I condition, I don't change. This is like saying conditional distribution of V given T is the same as unconditional distribution. So for all events. Hey, but this is again, in general, dependent on theta. Um, because V is again, is a function of X, T is a function of X and distribution of X dependent on theta. So I have to put a theta here. Um, however, so here's the, like the, um, the thing that I have here. So I've called this, um, is this true? So I've called this, um, what did I call this? Um, F A T. I call this QA, and I want to say whether they're equal. Um, what we can claim first is that although they depend on them on theta, in this case, neither one depends on theta, right? So this one does not depend on theta. Why? Because T is sufficient. So conditional distribution of V given T does not depend on theta. That's by sufficiency. And Unfortunately, I have it here. So this is also not dependent on theta by the fact that V is ancillary. Right? If you recall what ancillarity means, the distribution of V does not depend on theta. So that's also not dependent on theta. So great. So these are both statistics. This is actually a constant. This is a function of T only. We know it's a function of T. Um, why do we know it's, it's a function of T? This is actually a conditional expectation if you want. Uh, so everything that we did is the conditional expectation of the indicator of V in A. Given t. So conditional probability 
like in the abstract sense, you can define it via the conditional expectation. Conditional expectation is like one step above probability um, because expectation of an indicator function is the probability. So you can think of this as a variable, okay? Call this like Z or whatever, Y. So conditional expectation of Y given T if T, if, if, if Y is an indicator, it's just going to be probability. So everything that we talked about in terms of conditional expectations sort of transfers to probabilities. So they're just conditional expectation of special indicator variance. So this is definitely going to be a function of T. Um, and then what I want to show is this equality. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take the expectation and then claim the difference, like the exact same procedure we did. I want to show that the difference is zero. So I'm going to take the expectation. The expectation is zero um, for all theta. So why is that? No, this is not by completeness. So if this is true, then completeness implies the next step, which is what we want, because this is not really a function of t. This is a constant, this whole thing is a function of t. If this is true, then when t is complete, then this has to be zero. So we have this. And this is exactly what we're after. But why this is true? The same if I take the expectation of both sides of that, they're equal. Why the expectation of this is equal to the expectation of that? Tower property. Again, the tower property. Again, if you sort of understood this like little um, comment here. So this is, if you think of it as why, this is just expectation of why. Like the expectation of that indicator without conditioning is this, with conditioning is this. So this is just saying expectation of, so if I take the expectation of both sides now, um, this is going to be like, this is already a constant, so it comes out. But that would give me uh, the result that I want. Okay, so let me just not do this. Um, this is, uh, this guy is exactly that. This guy is expectation of Y. Right, I'm just going to take the expectation of both sides. This is going to come out itself. This is going to be um, the iterated expectation. So the expectation of this. So you're saying the expectation of this is equal to the expectation of this, which is itself. But, but that's exactly this quantity. So if you verify, this is just a law of iterated or power power property or iterated expectation. And then we are done. By completeness, we have to be equal. Uh, there is a bit of like almost everywhere and then um, because these events, there are many of them. So this holds for any fixed event. If you want to want it to hold for all events, then you have to worry that these almost everywhere P's might be different for these events. Um, I think people that worry about measure theory, we have one less person in the class we left, so we're fine. If anyone else worries, um, we can we can worry about that. Okay, but let's not worry. Um, it's it's good if you wanna like the main difficulty of this is like getting this part, but I'm not gonna worry about it. Okay. So uh, sorry, what you mean? Oh, you want to show, you also need to show that QA is a function for Q. Uh, QA is a function. What, what, what do I have to do? Because you want to apply the completeness of the P to Oh, yeah, because this is just a constant. So this is, this doesn't have anything to do with T. Yeah, it's, oh, really? it's going to be like independent of theta, and this is going to be a constant, like a number. Okay. But just, like that little bit of like the difficulty of proving this is just that measure theory is part of it, just like uh, many events, right? But, but you show it for like individual events, yes. Can you always, I mean, sort of said, can you always do the trick where you say like probability of something in this space is the expectation of the indicated limit? Can you say that again? Is that trick always work of going from the probability to the expectation of the indicator? Yes, so that's exactly like always true. So the expectation of an indicator. Um, it's just the probability of A. Or if you want, you can say the expectation of indicator of X is in A is the probability of um, X is in A. This is very simple. This is saying this is just the binary variable. It takes two values, okay? one and zero. It takes one with probability this. So if you want, this is like 
uh, one times this plus zero times the probability that x is not in a right so it's just for the, the expectation of that okay sounds good Okay, we're almost done, I guess, for today. Um, just want to point out maybe one result here. So you can um, use this lesson here. So think of this uh, location where we have take a unknown, um, sigma known, sigma squared. Uh, so the average of x i is, um, is complete sufficient. So we will see completeness. Um, and um, sufficiency you have already seen completeness we'll see later sort of and then the sample variance is um, sort of this right so you know this sample variance sort of is independent of this in the normal family so you can use Bazoo's here so these xi's minus x4 under ancillary I have seen this this location family. The difference does not depend on theta. Uh, it would depend on sigma, but sigma squared is known for us. So this is ancillary, this is incomplete. And so this guy is uh, a function of these ancillary statistics, all these deviations. So S squared is a function of an ancillary statistic. So itself is ancillary. So this derivation S squared does not depend on theta. So S squared is ancillary, X bar is complete sufficient, since these two are independent on their every one of these blocks, everything in this model, but it doesn't matter that sigma squared was like if we fixed it, we can change it the way that we argued is we fixed right that we get this parametric family. So these are independent, but the result is that uh, these are independent under every possible normal with theta and sigma squared. Yes. Yes. Wait, so is sigma squared being known necessary for this result that x bar and s squared are independent? That, that's what I tried to argue. So the way that you're using the Basu's theorem, right, like technically to fix this, now you have a parametric, parametric family. This is going to be ancillary for that parametric family because it doesn't depend on theta. If I took sigma squared as the parameter, this would no longer be ancillary because it has information about the variance. But I fix this, fix it. And then as a, as a very theta and parametric family, in that parametric family, this ancillary is complete sufficient, so they have to be independent. But independence, and this holds for all, all possible thetas, but independence is like the probability is theta. So this holds for any theta given that sigma squared. Later, you can change sigma squared to find a new parametric family in terms of theta. Under that, this also holds. If you argue like this, you see that this is going to hold. This is going to hold in this family, no matter what theta and sigma squared are. I do it separately for each sigma squared. Okay. Okay. So there is all holes true. But the way you argue is we, we have to fix this to make this answer. Yes, uh, almost done. Yeah. Yes. I have a question about probability one. So I think the converse of probability one is not generally too late. If yes. We find the minimal sufficient statistic is not always complete. Yes. Like I wonder if there's some way to like to show that it is not a so like we have a minimal sufficient statistic and and we want to see if it's complete. I think like if we can find a function of that statistic and that function like the F P is ancillary, then we can say it's not complete. Yes. But is there any other way to do that? Or so that's the example that we have so showing that it's not complete is easy sort of you have to find a function of it that's ancillary but proving that it's complete is just like any other complete statistics it's like you have to show it it's harder to show yeah so it is always true like we can find a function f such that f p is active no because sometimes you have complete sufficient statistics oh, okay. right so it's not always possible to do that because some 
and, and that particular one in that case would be minimal sufficient. So there's some minimal sufficient statistics that are also complete. There's some that are not complete. Showing that something is not complete is sort of easy. Showing that it's complete is not, and so we have to use all the machinery. Okay, thank you guys. I guess we'll, we'll talk next time. We'll continue next time.